Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to a lecture from the Mershon Center for International Security Studies at The Ohio State University. I am the center director, Dorothy Noyes, and today I am delighted to welcome Jesse Driscoll back to Ohio State. Jesse Driscoll is Associate Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Global Leadership Institute at the University of California at San Diego. He is an area specialist in the fuller sense of the word in Central Asia, the Caucasus, and the Russian-speaking world, and he actually covers that extensive territory with years of fieldwork in Tajikistan, Georgia, Ukraine, and beyond. But he is capable of turning interviews with 178 warlords, not just into a, not just into a compelling narrative, but into a compelling formal model that tracks it closely. Uh, in a way that managed to convince, in his first book, um, the Mershon Committee made of an ethnographer, a realist, and an experimentalist, which sounds like three people walking into a bar, but it was actually the three people who gave Jesse Driscoll the Furness Book Prize for his first project, uh, Warlords and Coalition Politics in Post-Soviet States, which came out in 2015 from Cambridge University Press. Uh, Driscoll parlayed on his experience with Tricky Places in a second book, Doing Global Fieldwork, A Social Scientist's Guide to Mixed Methods Research Far From Home, and this came out from Columbia in 2021. He has been discussing fieldwork today with our grad students at lunch, and in his uh, copious spare time, he co-hosts a podcast on methods in comparative politics called Raiders of the Lost Archive. Driscoll's most recent book, here before us, develops his interest in how community-level rivalries interact with state and international interests in all too timely a case study. Co-authored with Dominique Arel of the University of Ottawa, this book is Ukraine's Unnamed War Before the Russian Invasion of 2022, published again by Cambridge in 2023. And today he is going to give us a privileged view into the Minsk game. Please welcome Jesse Driscoll. So I, I keep coming back here because you always get the nicest introductions at, uh, at The Ohio State University. Thank you for having me. Um, so I want to begin with a piece of uh, Soviet propaganda art. This is from 1953. Uh, my translation of the Ukrainian is, we vote for peace and for brotherhood between the people. And uh, the girl has an orange hat, uh, which means she is meant to be Ukraine. And that's really all the art history I know. Um, but uh, one interpretation of the picture would be that this is Father Russia literally voting for little Ukraine. Another um, different interpretation would be that this is a family making an authentic political choice. And um, the truth is, I have no idea who you are or what you are seeing when you see this particular piece of art. And I don't know what it makes you feel. I don't know if it makes you feel proud or if it makes you feel uncomfortable or if it makes you feel um, sick. You might feel solidarity with both of them, um, or maybe more solidarity with one of them than the other. Um, and, and it could be that you just don't care very much, um, because you're from the humanities uh, in your spare time, but the truth is that um, you don't really trust me as a political scientist to have the opinions that I have. <laughs> it could be that you don't care very much because um, it's not your family. And because you have a strong sense that someone else in this room is feeling something really intense, but you're not sure what it is you're supposed to be feeling. And I just want to begin by saying that uh, all of that is legitimate and OK. And um, the emotions that are at play in this space are really intense. And I have only been in this space for 10 years or so. And I'm really grateful to uh, my co-author, uh, Dominique Echrel. He would appreciate the pronunciation. Um, he's the Danny Lu Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa. Um, and he's been my friend and companion in this space. And he has stopped me from making uh, more grievous errors than, um, than I make on my own. And so I still make some. And I want to begin by just being clear that I, uh, 
uh, I'm going to use a lot of antiseptic language today. It's kind of the language of game theory, you know, coordination and bargaining and ideal points. And um, I'm an ethnographer and a game theorist, as noted. But uh, you know, I know my limits. I'm going to try to keep the pathos to a um, to a minimum. Um, for those of you who are who are new to this, the invocation of game theory does not mean that I am treating Ukrainians um, as as game pieces. It, um, it's it's just the opposite. In fact, the the point of the modeling exercise for me is to try to give agency to Ukrainians as much as possible, like paying careful attention to Ukrainian choices, like Ukrainian strategic choices. Um, you can tell a story, and I try to tell a story, uh, where Ukraine is a victim of Russian criminal aggression and still emphasize that Ukrainians had and have a substantial agency, like story with Ukrainian heroes and Ukrainian villains, names and faces that are someday going to be remembered and accountable for the choices they've made. So for me, game theory serves kind of a disciplining function for storytelling. That's what I use it for. Um, political science is my home discipline. Um, you know, and we, we call them disciplines because they discipline us. So um, despite the antiseptic language, I, I want to just, I, I'm sorry, this is a little long-winded, but please know I am trying to be respectful to the emotions here. You know, this, this is stuff that, um, makes people cry and makes people bleed and makes people wake up screaming in the middle of the night. And that's all um, not the way a normal political science talk starts. Um, so thanks for indulging me, uh, political scientists in the room. Um, this is how political science talks normally start. Um, you know, uh, if what I just said was complex and perhaps disorienting and over subtle, there's nothing subtle at all about a 100 foot tall statue. Um, this used to be called the Kiev Motherland Monument, but Kiev Shinamat, but the Soviet hammer and sickle were shown in this picture being replaced by the Ukrainian national coat of arms, that's the Trezeb, it's being recast into the Ukrainian mother, mother Ukraine. So um, there's nothing like recasting a giant statue that's too big to ignore to visualize we win, you lose, sorry, not sorry, distributional politics. Um, and to some, you know, the explanation for this is pretty obvious and it doesn't actually require uh, a long lecture. You know, this is rally around the flag. We've got Mueller in the room. Um, part of this is just generational politics. You don't need a war to explain young people not wanting to look at symbols that don't mean anything to them and only mean something to people over the age of 60. Um, that happens in our country all of the time. But um, if you're listening to this talk, you probably know that um, I want to go a little bit deeper than those surface explanations, so I'm going to do my best. Um, this is a heat map of Zelensky votes uh, from 2019. So you can see pretty clearly from the map he's green. Uh, that he's the Eastern candidate. But you can also see pretty clearly from the map that he's the Eastern candidate in the newly defined de facto East, not the de jure according to international law 1991 borders East. There are missing populations that aren't voting. Now, they're not voting largely as a result of Putin's policies, but they're not voting. Um, and it's not rocket science, it's really just kind of political algebra. You have a new median voter in Ukraine. So the model I'm going to walk through today clarifies how Russia, using its military, tried to insert itself into bargaining between different Ukrainian social forces, and then how different Ukrainians adapted, anticipating Russian presence. And all this takes place before 2022, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So we call this, Dominique and I call this, the unnamed war, um, or the war before the war. And it's the subject of, of, of the book. The book ends with a kind of a thud on February 24th, 2022. Um, it's almost like we had a conflict resolution study that was interrupted by events. Um, so the title of this talk, The Minsk Game, is a reference to the Minsk Accords. For those of you who aren't aware, this was the internationalized ceasefire that froze the conflict in those northern gray areas. That's the DNR, LNR. Sometime in 2014, 2015, depending on which version of the accords you want to focus on. Um, and that is where certain previously cloaked and invisible threats um, by Russia became more overt. Um, so that's why we call it the Minsk game. And to be completely clear, as of now, like as of this, this day, the Minsk game is over. It is over largely because Ukrainians in charge in Kyiv didn't want to play it anymore. And the government in Kyiv has a lot of agency in our account. So if you are puzzled about why so few Ukrainians want a negotiated settlement, despite the huge costs of war, if you want to know what kinds of domestic political constraints an elected Ukrainian peacemaker will someday face, this talk might be useful for you. 
And um, if you don't like linear algebra, you're in very good company. You can read the book and enjoy the book and learn a lot. We put all the math in the back. Um, so you know, I'm going to not try to bludgeon you too much with things that I think would try your patience. I'm going to put a couple of pictures up. But unless there's a lot of questions in the Q&A, they won't be up there for long. So just, just muscle through with me. Bottom line up front, um, our approach highlights an intra-Ukrainian commitment problem. I'll explain what that means in more detail by the end of the talk. But in shorthand, I think it means that even if Ukraine achieved 100% of its war aims and got all of its 1991 territory back, and even if Putin were replaced by someone who you would actually want to negotiate with, these distributional political issues may not go away. And they may actually create pockets of angry losers, enough of them, to be able to restart an insurgency. That's the claim. So this would make governing reconquered territory quite difficult without a massive increase in Ukrainian state capacity. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible, um, but it means that we should ask ourselves what the help would and should look like. So that's the structure for the talk. I'm going to discuss the modeling assumptions, the setting, the order of play, um, some data, and then I'm going to conclude and I'm going to try to discipline myself so that there's lots of time for Q&A. That's the goal. So some of the slides, especially at the end, I'm just going to go through fast with the assumption that if you want me to go back to them, I'll go back to them. But that's not me rushing because I'm out of time. I, I built the deck that way. So what's being bargained over? Um, a, sp a special subset of symbols that I call national symbols. So you know, who ends up on the currency, who gets statues, who gets mentioned, and like a little bit more subtly, who doesn't get mentioned um, in really big speeches? That's the pie. That's what's being divided up um, mathematically um, you know, in the background. This is a dry definition from Gellner, first page of his book, Nations and Nationalism. Language is critical to our imagination. So there's been traditionally a linguistic east-west split in Ukraine. Um, this is uh, one of the four, we say, zero-sum issues that split the Ukrainian polity, traditionally. The other three involve the teaching of history, geopolitics, and geoeconomics. So a key modeling assumption is that what's being divided up is actually zero-sum. So it's a pie that isn't growing. There's something that's being fought over. And this is a very controversial assumption, so it's worth just taking a couple minutes to talk about it up front. It assumes away the politically beautiful, liberal, positive sum, multicultural compromises where everyone wins. And um, I wish that was the world that we lived in, but I fear that it's not. So the data that we use to justify the modeling assumption is, uh, you know, as follows. So do you need to speak Ukrainian and think in Ukrainian to be a Ukrainian? This is disputed. It's not a rhetorical question, it's just actually disputed. Is the Russian language part of the heritage of Ukraine, or is it a vector of infection for disinformation? This is disputed. It's not a rhetorical question, it's actually disputed. How do you pronounce certain rivers? How do you translate and transliterate certain cities? Should you spell Odessa with two S's or one S? Which one's right? This is disputed. This is off-the-shelf data from about a quarter century ago, 2001 census. This is a map of people who, when they were asked by a government census enumerator, what is your ethnicity, they answered, I am Russian. So it's 25 years old. Couple things to note. First off, the number is never higher than 50%, except for Crimea, corner case. Also note that there's an east-west split. You can kind of eyeball it. Darker on the far right, like 40%. The far west, Galicia, less than 4%, right? So flip the equation. 96% non-Russians in western Ukraine, 60 to 80% non-Russians in eastern Ukraine. That's a substantial difference. That's one piece of evidence for the east-west split. In the east, the numbers go way up if you ask variants of the question, what is your unique mother tongue? Or you ask, do you understand Russian? If you ask, do you understand Russian, the number goes nearly 100%, um, even, in, even in the west just because the languages are similar enough that people can, can understand each other when they talk. So second um, is, is how you teach historical tragedy and trauma. Um, and I have to say, I'm a parent. Um, what you're supposed to tell a six-year-old when they're at a very impressionable age about something that is really complicated but also horrible is a really hard problem as a parent. Um, so what do you empower elementary school teachers to say about tragic historical events that took place in the national memory. So this is a society with skeletons in the closet. 
to use the work of my colleague Monica Nalepa. Um, how do you remember and reconcile the Soviet past or the trauma from the pre-Soviet past? I'm not trying to simplify this. These are like real questions. In Ukraine, um, it's still being worked out. So this is one picture. This is the holy places of Kirsch. This is where Nestor the Chronicler is buried. I believe it's a UNESCO historical site. It certainly should be a UNESCO historical site. It would be a huge tragedy if this got turned into a parking lot. I think it's an active monastery. Um, but it's a reminder that there were Christians praying in Old Church Slavonic many, many hundreds of years ago, way before the Soviet Union, before the dark times, before the empire. That's one way to reconcile things. Um, but if you walk a few hundred meters away, you find this. Um, this is a monument to how much Ukrainians suffered as Ukrainians during the dark times. Uh, this is a, does anybody know what this is? First hand I see. Say it louder. Did anybody say anything? Nobody knows what this is. Correct, sir. Thank you. I knew someone was going to say it. I, I just was wondering, was wondering who. Yes, the artificial famine killed four million or so Ukrainians. Uh, those numbers are disputed. Uh, but it's almost like city planners in Kiev uh, wanted to make sure that you couldn't really go to one place without going to the other because it's built just a couple hundred feet away. So when you visit there for the first time and you get your English language guidebooks and you're just kind of walking around, it's like, huh, this is a place with an interesting, complicated set of symbols describing its history. So um, I, uh, I share that with you not to reconcile this. Um, but just to note that in one version of the historical narrative, we all suffered together. And in the other version of the historical narrative, you starved us. And both are there. They're just sitting there. Now, most Americans join the conversation for the last two bullet points, geoeconomics and geopolitics. You get into symbolic statements made by leaders about geopolitical and economic preferences, usually aspirational. <laughs> usually they're saying what they want in the future, you know, and, and sometimes people say they want different things. Um, uh, in geopolitical shorthand, um, you would say that the West is closer to Poland and the East is closer to Russia on security and economic matters, or at least you would before 2010 and no one would look at you funny if they knew about the country. Um, Rust Belt factories more likely to be in the East, higher Airbnb prices further in the West. These are sweeping claims, sweeping, sweeping claims. Nonetheless, these are the kind of sweeping claims that people made all the time about the bottom-up preferences of voters in the East and in the West in Ukraine. And for history buffs, I know 2008 sounds like a really long time ago, but back in 2008 when the Bucharest Declaration was made, NATO was really not very popular in the East, according to the surveys that you could take, and it was more popular in the West, although its popularity even in the West was lukewarm. That was 2008, of course. Very different world now. So. The point is, on these very, very big issues, like how much your children are going to have in common with your grandparents, or um, which security trade community you want your leaders to tell your neighbors that you should want to join, state policy matters, OK? Who you vote for matters. And it makes sense on these, even if they're symbolic matters, it makes sense that people should sometimes mobilize and organize and lobby to try to get their group's hands on the wheel. And you can use this perception that your group is being threatened by another group that's trying to get its hands on the wheel in order to gin up votes. And so what do I mean by this concretely? In 1994, and then again in 2004, and then again in 2010, the presidential contests were decided in runoffs between a candidate who represents all nine of the oblasts with large Russian-speaking populations, always winning with great majorities, against a candidate from central or western Ukraine, Kravchuk, Yushchenko, Timoshenko, always winning with the 16 Ukrainian-speaking oblasts with great majorities. So I don't think this is primordial, to be completely clear. I think this is actually a complicated result of some constructivist mechanisms. I think that electoral incentives exist to construct these cleavages, and those incentives are reinforced constantly by social policy debates framed as zero-sum politics around the sorts of things that I just talked about. That's why I used the sort of pejorative language of ginning up votes. 
Some people do benefit, however, from language laws and job seeking like, advantages or job security providing advantages provided to Russian speaking members of the polity. And others view that as an inappropriate subsidy and part of a gross and oppressive colonial legacy. And they'll tell you that. They'll tell you that in that kind of language if you ask them face to face. None of this is taboo in Ukraine. I'm just describing things that a lot of people believe is true. So that's what we're modeling, that bargaining process. So that's what's being bargained over. So far, I've talked a lot about Ukraine, and I haven't talked about Russia. So let's, let's stop that. Let's talk a little about Russia. People bargain, but there's violence lurking in the background. And it matters a lot that this game we're talking about is being played in a country where Russia is a neighbor, and the ethnic minority in question is Russian. Okay, so this is what Rogers Brubaker in the 1990s identified as the triadic configuration. You have a state bordering Russia, you have a Russian minority demographically concentrated inside that state, and you have Russia. That's the triangle, okay? So this is a map from the Soviet Atlas of Ethnicities. It's a map with big bright colors. Benedict Anderson, the map, the census, and the museum. Check, check that out. Um, when the Soviet Union broke up, the old ethnic federal boundaries served as institutional templates for the new states. So Claire Kaiser at Georgetown calls them entitled nations, which is great because it's a better term than what we were stuck with before, which was titular nations, which no one ever wanted to say. So entitled nations, Claire Kaiser, Georgetown, cite it. Um, Stephen Kotkin quips that the Soviet Union broke up like a chocolate bar in neat little pieces. And there's truth to that analogy. Um, but you need to get beyond that simple analogy to understand a little more of what's going on in Ukraine. I like an additional analogy of the tide receding at a rocky beach, uh, where you end up with tide pools. So concretely, demographically, you have tens of millions of self-identified Russians who find themselves living in territory that they think of as home, but suddenly they're living outside of Russia. So they have to decide if they want to emigrate or assimilate or stick around and organize politically as Russians. So David Layton described this choice set, and he also gave the group a name, the beached diaspora, to kind of capture the tide pools. And I, I love it. Tide goes in, leaves these little funny tide pools of Russian influence. So you know, just eyeballing it, I realize the map is fuzzy, but Crimea is in pink, right? Conspicuously important little corner case there. There's others. Two more quick points. The first is that a lot of Russians don't believe that Ukraine exists. And that's a hard thing to swallow. So let me just, let me just roll that into the middle of the room in an explicit way. Despite the bright colors, um, not all of these nations were equal in status in the Soviet project. Um, and Putin um, is having a lot of textbooks printed right now, as we speak, in Russia that are explaining that, um, you know, to a whole generation of Russian students, by the way, that um, Ukrainian and Russian should actually be the same color. That, that actually orange is, is just fake news from the West, um, and, and that Ukraine was never a real nation, so therefore it cannot be a legitimate nation state. And um, I really wish this were just Putin. I really do wish it were only one guy. I worry that that's just wrong. I worry that it's more than one guy. Many Russian citizens will say, if asked, if asked on a survey, they'll say what they know they're supposed to say, um, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with those data, but a lot of people, when asked on surveys, um, say a lot of things that, frankly, I think most of us would think are pretty strange about the world, but they believe that they are right. And one of those strange things is um, that they don't believe, some of them, that Ukrainian nation statehood is a thing. And you can understand a great deal more about what Russia has done since 2020 if you, if you begin to try to grapple with that strangeness. Um, they also, by the way, don't like being lectured by Americans about history. They don't really think we understand anything about history in this part of the world, and they, they resent the idea that they should listen to us tell them about their own history. So I'll, that, that's one thing. The second, if I haven't provoked you enough, is that um, they're not inclined to make that same claim about other bright colors on this map. Not in my experience. I've had a lot of time talking to Russians in Central Asia, and I have really never heard the Russians say that, um, that Tajiks aren't a real people. They say a lot of other things about Tajiks, and a lot of other things about Uzbeks, and a lot of other things about Germans, and Americans, and Gypsies, and don't get me started. They don't make that claim very often. They make that claim about Ukrainians. 
So um, I'm not saying that to amplify it. I'm just, I'm just saying it. Based on my life experience, it seems to be a one-off with the Ukrainian nation. So I'm overlaying here the standard map. Took this from Wikipedia a couple days ago. It shows the approximate state of play of territorial control that's being bargained over in real time. Russia claims that what is going on is an absolutely straightforward reading of the UN Charter, that Ukrainians should be able to leave Ukraine if they want to. Yes, there was a treaty signed in 1997 fixing the border between Ukraine and Russia, but it would be the greater of two evils to leave all of those people beached tragically in Ukraine. And they want to rejoin the motherland. And look, they just voted. Who could be against that? We know the story. They annexed the land bridge with sham elections, two more oblasts after a failed effort to seize Kiev. Hundreds of thousands are dead. Millions are displaced and all the rest. And they will, with a straight face, say, well, we were acting defensively. And, and you just don't understand. The language they use is Article 1 of the UN Charter, self-determination. They will also use the language of responsibility to protect from the Kosovo precedent. They will also, of course, use the precedent set by the US invasions of Iraq and regime change in Libya and, and elsewhere. And um, in their narrative, they will say that they're not even fighting Ukraine. They are fighting the West, and that's coincidentally taking place on the territory of Ukraine. They will say all of these things all the time. And um, you know, I want to just veer for a moment into the, into the editorial here. Uh, I'm not saying any of that to carry water for the Russian government's position. From my point of view, as Jesse, all of that is wrong, OK? And what Putin's regime is doing is, is criminal and toxic. To be specific, the argument that if you speak Russian, you are somehow part of a quote unquote Russian world, and that they then have a right to come to your protection is grotesque. And there were no real human rights abuses, for the most part. They were mostly manufactured to justify Russia doing what it wanted to do anyway in 2014. And as a liberal, the claim that when people disappear from censuses, that is genocide, which is a claim that is often made when people change their identities because they have changed their self-identity, that that is somehow, through some sort of weird white replacement theory reading of human history, that that is genocide as a liberal. That is offensive to actual victims of actual genocide. And as a realist, checking the liberalism stuff at the door, I just think it gets the incentives completely wrong and would be an important wrong precedent um, that you should be able to rattle a nuclear saber even if there are big emotional national minority issues at stake and then seize the territory of your neighbor and not have there be consequences. So for all of those reasons, I think that despite the fact that I have given airtime to the Russian position, I want to be clear that I really don't believe it. And I don't think it's a good idea that it should just float out there in the ether unchecked. I'm not trolling you. I'm just telling you what Russian diplomats actually say. But look, with all of that hand wringing, this is the actual um, geography. Leaving the colors aside. Whatever happens, however this end, Ukraine is going to share a border with Russia. That's just the geography of this. So the Kremlin, in our model, it's a lot of wind up. Here's the pitch. The Kremlin gets the last move in the game. Russia gets to watch politics take place inside communities, inside their neighbors, see what happens, see if those communities call for help, and then they get to decide if they're feeling like showing up or not. And they might show up in secret, and they might not show up at all. They might say that they didn't show up and then actually show up. They might not actually show up and then afterwards say they showed up. Both can happen. That's just the reality of the way that we think the order of moves goes down. So a critical parameter in the game, when you solve the game, is this parameter A, which is your probability that Russia is going to show up. But you have to make the choice not knowing what they're going to do because they get the last move in the game. That's why the order matters. So. Why do we call it the Minsk game? We call it the Minsk game because, um, like all colonial violence, it works best when it's invisible. 
it works best when you have a credible threat, but you don't actually need to carry it out. So um, we like the Minsk Accords as the title for the game because the Minsk Accords are where the bargaining and the coercion, extortion, whatever you want to call it, becomes the most overt. But that requires the Maidan crisis, and that requires us to like go through a little bit more history here. So a lot of the data and depiction is um, going to come here dedicated to showing that the underlying bargaining actually had deeper roots. It's not like it sprung into existence in 2014. Um, so I hope you'll indulge me a little bit on that. But I don't think this is history that most people know. Um, and if you want to know more, of course, there's a commercially available product where you could learn even more. But I want to give you the, the kind of wave tops. So um, the engine of our book is a constructivist insight, which is that just because you have a bunch of people who speak Russian, and um, even if maybe they once took a survey or toward a census enumerator, something about who they are, um, when the stakes are really, really high, they have to actually coordinate together as a community to become a politically, ethnically Russian community. And it just doesn't mean the same thing at all um, in the abstract, antiseptic, clicking an internet survey response as it does during a crisis, an existential crisis, when you think that the border might actually change. That's the argument. So to construct that community like that as a politically Russian community um, is an act of sedition against Ukraine. And it's a high stakes choice. It is a really high stakes choice to make. It requires extensive coordination. Now, once you coordinate, once you have coordinated, once your whole community has gotten on board, you can actually begin to bargain with the center. Um, what's being bargained over? I already described it. It's this pie. What's the pie filling? It's this cultural goods stuff. Kiev wants to give away less of this stuff by assumption. The community wants more of this stuff by assumption. Again, these are just simple, crude mathematical assumptions that you can use in order to understand the same problem in the same way. Math is the universal language and all that. So it's a high stakes game, so it's a one shot game. It's a two stage game, which means you kind of go in different orders. The first stage is where you have an unexpected political earthquake. In our book, the Maidan events are that earthquake. And then there's an attempt by elites to coordinate inside a Russian-speaking community on a position which, again, is going to get them in a lot of trouble, but it might be a decent bargaining position. They might not get in trouble. We call that coordinated sedition. Then in the second stage, you see if the center takes the offer or not. And then in the third stage, there's a move by nature resolution. This is an optional third stage. That's why we call it a third stage game. This isn't strategically interesting. This is just a bunch of moves by nature. You kind of figure out whether all these parameters work out or not. But the bottom line is that if the government doesn't accept the offer, um, the government will send in the police to arrest the ringleaders for sedition and have them tried. And you know, maybe that works, and, and maybe it doesn't. And maybe the Russian military uses the pretext um, to show up and help that community. Maybe they do it clandestinely, maybe they don't do it at all. But the point is that in all four of these worlds, there is a lot of violence, a lot of different kinds of violence, actually. So um, it's always bad. It's always bad for someone, and it's way worse in different scenarios depending on what nature does. But just treat it like nature. It's a, it's a storm warning. How much snow are we going to get tomorrow? I don't know. You have to make a probabilistic choice, not quite knowing what's going to happen in the final stage. What a Russian-speaking community should do in equilibrium is they should make the offer that gives them the highest percentage of the pie that they think the center is going to take. So you push elites in Kiev up against the wall, facing the ugliest of possible counterinsurgency scenarios. We call this brokered autonomy. This is the best outcome from the perspective of members of the Russian-speaking community if we have their preferences mapped right. This is the path of play for most of Ukrainian history since independence until Maidan, we say. We say it provides actually a pretty good explanation for how the bargaining played out at key critical junctures. So sometimes making these compromises to keep the Russian-speaking population loyal means that you keep a 300-foot obnoxious statue with a hammer and sickle in downtown Kiev for decades and decades after independence, even though a lot of people don't like looking at it, and it kind of makes them sick. That's the kind of bargain that we're talking about. And you should all notice that that statue stayed up after Maidan. It's not the very first thing that happened after the 2014 events. It's been up for a long time. So also worth noting that coordination in the first stage is not automatic. Coordination games are never automatically solved. For any of you who are teachers who have actually made your students play a stag hunt, you can explain it to them a lot and still have the funniest strategies come up when you have them play. 
Um, if you're a community leader in eastern Ukraine, and you start flying a Russian flag and most of your neighbors don't, it's quite possible that you're going to have that flag taken down and have your windows broken. If you're the only person acting and you don't have safety in numbers, it might not go very well for you. So in a stag hunt analogy, that's the going hungry payoff. That's if you try to catch a stag, but everyone else is playing rabbit, you go hungry. In this setting, you don't just go hungry. You, you might get run out of town on a rail. So safety in numbers is really important. But just like in a stag hunt, sometimes everyone coordinates on the all-rabbit equilibrium. And in this case, what that means is that your community basically stays loyal to the center. No one can accuse you of sedition. But of course, you drag your feet from time to time, and your preferences are still reflected at the center. You don't actually go through the performance of threatening to secede. You just let it be known that you're not happy, and, and you vote next time you get a chance. So. Um, in this situation, the choice will always yield you a little bit less than if you played hardball. It won't be the same offer. When you solve the model, it will be less. That's what happens when you change the order of play. If the community is the one who's at the, uh, um, on the receiving end of an offer that comes from the center, um, the center will use the off-the-path threat of the violence to chisel the offer. And if the community goes first, they will use the off the path threat of violence to chisel the offer. So um, we call this enforced assimilation. This is the all play rabbit outcome. It can be much worse depending on circumstances, but no one's windows get broken here. And again, when I say it can be much worse, it can be much, much worse. You don't want to end up here. And the good news is you won't unless there's a misplay. You don't end up here unless things go really sideways. We say that things did go sideways in 2014 and 2015, but that is a result of strategic misplay. And I can describe that in the book. If you care, we describe it at length. Here, I'll describe it for you in the Q&A. In the nutshell, that's the game. And again, it's a better model of brokerage than it is of strategic misplay. No model is good at explaining the things that go wrong. But in the real world, things do sometimes go wrong. And of course, I can describe them for you. But in the spirit of this talk, I'm not going to talk about the war. I'm going to talk about the places where things basically went according to plan. So Crimea um, is where things went according to plan. Crimea flirted with secession multiple times. Um, a coordinated platform emerges in the early uh, period of independence. And this is all extremely well documented in the English language in multiple sources. Nothing I'm about to tell you I think is going to be super controversial, even though some of you might not know it. It was the only territory of Ukraine with a clear ethnic majority. And Russian leaders had been on the record asking for Crimea back as well, although, of course, they didn't, they didn't get it at the time. Um, people in Crimea knew that Russia might be tempted to do what they said they wanted to do, and so they used that as leverage in their bargaining with Kiev. Plus, it's a peninsula. It's kind of defensible. Plus, the Black Sea is there. So there was a lot of leverage. My colleague at UCSD, Phil Roeder, has documented beautifully how this actually went down. He calls it a segment state that was set up, and he describes it as essentially a dress rehearsal for a similar coordinated action in 2014. In our reading of the case, there's a telling moment in all this bargaining that not that many people know about. So in 1994, there was another attempt to renege on that 1992 agreement that I just described. Um, it was led at the time by the president of Crimea. And um, it was too much. Like, Kiev balked at the demands. And this led to a standoff. And it was resolved that summer only after it became clear that the government in Russia had no actual interest in redrawing the border. So once Yeltsin clarified that his government was not actually going to do anything, then it became possible for um, Kiev to play hardball. The Crimean presidency was actually removed as an institution so that there would never again be a Crimean president who would try to do the same thing again. And um, formally, anyway, Kiev kept control of Crimean security structures. And that was a revision to the initial bargain, very consistent with the logic of our model. Everyone watching parameter A. So what about coordination outside of Crimea, where the Russians are always in the minority? Well, there it's a trickier thing. Um, they have to build institutions to coordinate. So, so they did. The way we tell the story of the creation of those institutions begins in 1993. There was a general strike in the Donbass that paralyzes the whole country. It was a big deal. We've got the New York Times coverage up there, front page. It's on the left. 
Um, the strike was organized by Russian-speaking Donbass elites. Uh, they had patrons in Moscow um, during the Soviet time, but now you know, events have changed, and they feared that they were at risk of being dealt out of real power in Kyiv, and they never really cared about Kyiv before. But now they needed to make Kyiv care, so they, they mobilized the very real grievances <laughs> of lots of miners who were worried about appalling working conditions and hyperinflation, uh, and um, they paralyzed the whole country. And the strike was eventually resolved by concessions by Kyiv to hold early parliamentary and presidential elections two years before the end of Kravchuk's scheduled five-year term. Now, the coordination of this reconstituted communist party in eastern Ukraine during this period was one legacy. From that group would come a group of Russian-speaking MPs in eastern Ukraine who we're going to hear from again in just a few moments. But the other legacy of it is that what you got was a set of quite standard bundled together campaign issues. The recognition of Russian as a second language. Autonomy for Donbass, using the code word of federalism and economic um, in, um, independence. Nurturing geopolitical linkages with Russia. So by the early 2000s, those Donbass elites had begun to shift their alliance to a new party because they needed to rebrand from communists by 2000. Um, and, and they called themselves the Party of Regions. Now, um, the Party of Regions is important um, to the Orange Revolution of 2004. Um, some of you in this room probably remember the Orange Revolution of 2004. Others of you are too young. Um, but it was a big deal. The Orange Revolution of 2004 was one of those things that made um, realists in the United States sit up and, and take notice of things going on that previously they had poo-pooed, this thing called civil society. Oh, it turns out maybe there's something there. It also made Russian realists sit up and um, take notice of this thing called civil society. Like, huh, it's the CIA. Um, and um, you know, both of those narratives uh, go viral. Uh, at the time, but in, in many ways, this is a dress rehearsal for the Maidan events a decade later. So um, you have Yanukovych representing the Party of Regions, you have Yushchenko representing the hopes and dreams of people who want a uh, more EU and Western-oriented government. This is in shorthand, of course, I'm going fast. But um, as a reminder of what else is going on, um, some of Yushchenko, um, some of Yushchenko's people um, uh, and Yanukovych's people take this election to the next level, and some of Yanukovych's goons actually uh, um, poison uh, Yushchenko with dioxin. And so the scars on his face become a kind of a, a reminder of what's actually going on here, um, other than just language policy, you know, other than just symbolic politics. So um, to simplify greatly, the election is rigged for Yanukovych. People notice. People protest peacefully, and they succeed. And in the West, this is hailed as a huge victory. And in the East, this is hailed as um, a huge problem. Uh, Putin comes out in 2007 later and like, says exactly what he thought about this. But this is where we first get a hint of his worldview. Uh, and the term color revolutions comes into being around this time. So um, the idea that this is a dress rehearsal for Maidan, I think, is true in more ways than one. And everything I just said before, I'm getting some positive body language from the room. And I think a lot of you knew it. I, I doubt very many of you know this. Um, but this emerged from the research with Dominique. During this chaotic period um, between the, the protests and the, and the resolution, the Party of Regions held a special meeting in Donbass in the town of Sverdonetsk, threatening to call a referendum on, quote, the possible changes in the administrative territorial structure of Ukraine, unquote. The threat was to empower regions to just disregard orders from the center in the east uh, if Yanukovych didn't get his way. And the governors of Kharkiv and Luhansk, as well as the head of the Donetsk, the Donetsk Regional Parliament, called the, for the creation of a, quote, southeastern autonomous republic, unquote. The Kharkiv governor explicitly threatened to call for Russian military intervention. So a week later, there's a third round of voting ordered and a new electoral law, and the West declares victory. And um, the thing is, embedded in this was a compromise, which was to have Yushchenko agree to have the powers of the presidency reduced so that the parliament controlled by Yanukovych, he'd become the prime minister, could actually stall a bunch of the reforms, which he does. And then people get frustrated that the reforms aren't happening, because they're not. Yanukovych loses the post of, post of prime minister in 2008, but all of that set the stage for his future rise to the head of state in the 2012 elections. So this is a map of the single member districts of Ukraine. The Party of Regions is shaded in black. Um, eight years ago, I put up really similar maps to this. So if you're interested in knowing more about the Maidan events, um, you can um, consult YouTube and um, 
you can learn more. I'm going to start going very quickly through the slides here because I assume that if you want to know more, there's a lot of places to learn it other than this particular talk. But um, just so that you know, the coordinated elites of the Donbass really ruthlessly took over a lot more of the state than just the Donbass. So I've been talking a lot about these Donbass elites and these Donbass elites as if it's kind of a corner of the, of the country. It's not. By 2012, they, they had a pretty convincing um, majority in the Rada. This is not showing the party list seats. This is just the single member districts in the Rada. Okay? So in 2012, after they secured both the presidency and you know, parliamentary votes for the first time, the Party of Regions is in power, and one of the things they do is they adopt a law that gives official status to the Russian language. This makes it, quote unquote, a regional language. This status applies to any oblast with at least 10% of the population declaring Russian as a language of origin, which is basically the entire East. And um, then, in the fall of 2013, Yanukovych makes the fateful announcement that he's going to hit pause on the Vilnius summit of EU ascension and explore the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union. And this is one symbolic step too far. And um, this is a picture of how the Maidan events were covered on Western television. Looks like 1989. This is a picture of how they were covered on Russian television. Looks more like Les Miserables. Mm -hmm. Things escalated and came to a head on February 20th, 2014. This is the day of the Maidan massacre. Snipers fire on protesters, 40 people die. The Party of Regions collapses. This is the Party of Regions on February 20th. This is the Party of Regions on February 21st. Yanukovych flees in the middle of the night. One of the really interesting things that we learned as a result of doing this research is that he actually fled to Kharkiv. It seems like the Party of Regions, some of them, were thinking about using state resources to continue the fight, to argue that that had been an unconstitutional coup back then. And that, you know, the army and all the police forces that are still loyal to the state should, you know, meet in Kharkiv. <laughs> That'd be different. That'd be a different version of human history than the, the thread that we're on. Um, and, and, and it just didn't happen. Yanukovych then eventually ends up in Russia. But that's a, that's a matter of really substantial Ukrainian agency, I would say. That was a choice made by a, a Ukrainian, I would say. Um, a new chapter is opened in, in the book of Ukrainian history. And let me just tell you, that book reads really differently in Russian than in English. Um, and I've done a great deal of work on social media trends uh, that you can read. And I'm happy to talk about this more. But suffice to say, there are two different high-power geopolitical, geopolitical narratives of what takes place in Maidan. And they talk right past each other. Uh, in terms of the outcomes. One is meant to legitimize the post-Maidan state. One is meant to delegitimize the post-Maidan state. And um, we in the West call it the revolution of dignity. I do. Um, people in Russia call it a coup. Um, to this day, they call it a coup. And um, that's a problem. It's, it's a problem that we don't agree on what to call this. Um, today, it's a problem. But back then, it was a big problem. Because back then, it wasn't just a matter of Russian diplomats and uh, State Department diplomats. It was a matter of what the Russian speakers in the East were going to say to each other about those two narratives. So not everyone in Ukraine bought into the premises of the dignity narrative, at least not at first. Today, things, are, I think, are very, very different, but not at first. So this is a map of where you had very, very large, like 10,000 person or more protests against Maidan. And OK, can you spot the east-west split? These people protesting are not engaging in coordinated sedition the way that we're thinking about it. What they're doing is they're mad because they had voted for a party, and now um, they realize that that party isn't going to be able to give them any of the things that, that it had promised them because it has been thrown out of power by people power. And so they're doing people power. But in terms of the east-west split, you guys, they're not doing it everywhere. The first domino to fall is Crimea. If you want to read a great article in the English language documenting the elites in Crimea, telling you exactly what they planned to do, and they wrote all this stuff down, big parliamentary speeches before Yanukovych fled, Oksana Mishlovka in Nationalities Papers publishes an extremely readable and well-researched piece, and I encourage you to go read it. Um, but there's just no way to stretch the definition of the word war to say that there was a war in Crimea. There, there, there wasn't. Uh, the Russian military sent about 78 forces 
we think. We document everything we could in the book. We want it to be as bulletproof as we can. But what we see is rapid coordination by elites. 75% of the government just becomes politically Russian. Most of the military, we have this broken down by subgroups of the military, tear off their Ukrainian insignia and slap on a Russian insignia. That's not a typo. 99% of the state security administration defects to Russia. So it is important to note there were a couple of deaths, and every death is a tragedy. And I don't want to whitewash the heroism, in particular, of some extremely brave Tatars who mobilized at that time because they could see what was happening, and they tried to stop the vote. And because they mobilized and tried to stop the vote, we know there were little green men at all. If they hadn't done that, we never would have seen the little green men Russia wouldn't have needed to unveil in order to protect the key government buildings for the vote to take place. And it would look even more like self-determination and not like AstroTurf. However, with that said, those Russians did not face a very difficult operating environment when they were there. It would have been very different if the Russian troops had shown up, as far as I can tell, anywhere else in Ukraine. So Crimea, again, why I keep calling it a corner case? That's why. There's a street presence everywhere else in Ukraine that is pro-Maidan, and there's a street presence in some parts of Ukraine that is anti-Maidan. And oftentimes those pro-Maidan and anti-Maidan forces are clashing with each other. But not in Crimea. In Crimea, there's no pro-Maidan ground game, and so you get quick, coordinated sedition, and that is something our model can explain really quite well. It's not really brokered autonomy here, because brokered autonomy implies that you're getting autonomy within a country. What it actually is, is irredentist sedition and secession. Russian irredentism married with Ukrainian secession. Now, I see a lot of Crimean agency in that story that I just told. Whether it's Ukrainian agency or Crimean agency is a matter of interpretation, but I don't think they were voting with guns at their heads. Not exactly. I just, I don't believe that is factually correct. Um, now, everywhere else, I can't emphasize enough, everywhere else the guns come out pretty fast. And um, on both sides. And this is where coordinated success and failure becomes highly contingent. You don't automatically get a stag in a stag hunt. So um, Crimea turns out to be a one-off. When I said it's the first domino to fall, that was, I believe, the Russian military theory of victory, was a lot of dominoes falling, and then they end up in control of the whole north shore of the Black Sea. But then when only one domino falls, they don't get to do that. So every other oblast in Ukraine is a chaotic mess. People try to spare themselves the worst possible kind of violence, sometimes successfully, a few times tragically unsuccessfully. I have many backup slides on this. I can show this in depth if this is what you want to talk about. Um, and this is the part of the book that frankly took the longest to write because uh, my co-author Dominique is a perfectionist and because my co-author Dominique and I wanted to be really, really careful to not inadvertently reproduce any misinformation or disinformation. So we were really careful with how we sourced things and sourced them in the Ukrainian language as much as we could from credible journalists because we realized that we will be attacked no matter what for getting it wrong. And I'm sure that we are not getting everything right, but we tried really hard. We tried really, really hard to describe um, what the Russians at the time called the Russian Spring. It turns out it was a Ukrainian spring. It turns out that the streets basically everywhere went Ukrainian. Not automatically, and it was messy, but in the end that's kind of what happened. And um, you might not find our account convincing, but of the, uh, to those of you who consider yourselves um, historians, I think the real historical contribution of our work is, um, is that chapter, is the um, chapter six the Russian spring, or the Ukrainian spring. So um, in our story, what happens is Russia observed where the pro-Russia, pro-seditionist militias could actually hold territory after a couple weeks. And then they intervened. And um, the Battle of Ilovaisk is where you have uh, Russian military regulars um, eventually settling things. And that gets you the Minsk Accords. Um, now, I put these squares up here um, to show th this is sort of like the very large estimate of where Russia sent troops. Um, there's ongoing work uh, by, in particular, Sergei Kudelia at Baylor. It's not all the way through peer review yet, but it's the best work I'm aware of in terms of trying to figure out how much of this war was bottom up, grassroots, and how much of this war was top down. AstroTurf. And so, you know, according, everyone agrees there were some Russians running around Crimea, but where else were they running around? You know, somewhere between these two dotted lines is where the Russians were running around. 
Um, in our reading, again, um, it was mostly grassroots, but that's we're, our, our book is not the last word on that, and this is going to continue to be something that people have strong opinions on. So um, what, what no one really bothers to disagree about is that at the Battle of Ilovaisk, <laughs> Russia, Russia is there. Um, they deny that they're there, but they're there, and this freezes the conflict, forcing Kiev to sign what are called the Minsk Accords. Now, the Minsk Accords, if you actually want to go read them, they're really short. This is like three pages of text. It won't take you long. Um, th they are a ceasefire document. There's no longer any uncertainty now about what leg of the game tree you are on. Um, Russia has now made clear that there is a gap between the de facto and de jure border of Ukraine. And if you want to restore that border, here's what you have to do. And their list of demands um, concretely is about autonomy for their people, quote unquote, because they want those people to be able to vote in the Rada so that Russia can have its voice heard in the new Ukrainian polity. That's more or less what they wanted. And um, this is all in shorthand. I'm going fast. But they, they promised to have a ceasefire to stop shooting at each other. Um, it breaks down almost immediately. Ukraine promises that it's going to give autonomy to those provinces, although this is vaguely defined, and um, let them vote. And Russia promises that it's going to withdraw heavy weapons and let Ukraine take control of its border back. And um, what's not in there? OK, nothing about Crimea, for one thing. And you know a whole bunch of other stuff that later becomes part of the conversation. But there's nothing in those documents about NATO expansion, for instance. You know, like, go, go, go read them. Later on, these documents become about a bunch of things that, that they weren't initially about. But um, there's also a commitment problem that comes up pretty fast. So the reason that um, there is another big battle, De Beltseve, and the reason that a lot of conflict negotiation professionals make reference in shorthand to Minsk I and Minsk II, although the OSCE does not make that distinction. They just call it one unified Minsk process, or they used to. Um, that distinction was because Russia needed to restart the war, put the gun to Ukraine's head again, and make them sign something else to clarify the sequencing. And in the sequencing, Ukraine is supposed to have the vote, and then Russia gives the border back, whereas before that was sort of unclear. And when it was unclear, the commitment problem was even clearer. Both sides really feared that if they went first, the other side would just not follow through on its agreement, and it would be worse off. And that's fairly straightforward commitment problem boilerplate. It's the kind of thing political scientists think that they understand quite well. And so it's not that surprising from that perspective that negotiations stalled out for so long. Both sides feared that they would be taken advantage of if they went first, and so neither went first. And um, I thought they could sort of say stalled like that forever. I really did. Not forever, but for a long time. And I thought that because they did stay stalled for a long time. To simplify greatly, you know, five years later, we're back to this map, right? Crimea is still not voting. The DNR, LNR still aren't voting. And, um, you know, this is about the time that Dominique and I were wrapping up the very first draft of our book. You know, we thought we had a book that was describing um, a situation that needed conflict resolution type analysis, and that was the book that we were writing. Okay, so what did we say? Uh, I think it's important to go back to this and just talk briefly through um, the way things look through the looking glass. So again, I don't expect any of you to share the assumptions that I'm about to like, you know, impose on the actors in the model, but um, if you are in the secessionist DNR, LNR, you are up at the top. You, this is a really bad outcome. Okay, you have been living now for a long time in an internationalized conflict, de facto secession. Good, good news is you won the secessionist war with some help from Russia. Bad news is really bad. <laughs> really, really bad. You don't have an economy, you've watched your friends die, and it's way worse than that if you want to get into the, gr the grueling details. Um, they wish they were in Crimea. Right? They wish that they had all of the ability to speak Russian and all of the ability to trade freely with Russia and have labor mobility with Russia, but without all the violence. But they do have all the violence. So um, if you go in there and you ask them what they want, uh, they'll, they'll tell you, although of course most Western social scientists can't do that because you can't get access to the region, but there are exercises, voting exercises, probably sham, you know, that suggest what they want. What they want is to join Russia. Russia doesn't want to take them. Contra Crimea, which Russia was happy to take. Russia wants to keep this indefinitely as a kind of a bargaining chip. So in our model, from their perspective, uh, they are getting some of what they want in terms of the cultural pie. It's just they got it at huge costs. 
Um, what's going on in the rest of Ukraine? Down at the bottom. Um, down at the bottom, life is quite different. Down at the bottom, you have this thing we call enforced assimilation, which is pretty bloodless and abstract. But you have to understand that in our telling of the story, this is the commitment problem. And this is different than the sequencing commitment problem that I was telling you about before, which is about who moves first. I think everybody gets that. Probably you do. If not, I can explain it to you later. This one is harder, because this one means you're taking the preferences of Ukrainians prior to 2014 about what language they wanted to speak and et cetera seriously. It is a problem a fundamental problem that between 2015 and 2022, there's a population of Ukrainians, territorial Ukrainians, passport Ukrainians, that really want a great deal of cultural and symbolic autonomy from Kiev, and Kiev doesn't want to give it to them. Russia's guns are purchasing something for this population, um, and they want to have that thing. We might not want them to have that thing, but they want to have that thing. And they're worried that if they settle, they won't get it. Why are they worried that if they settle, they won't get it? Well, because it's been made pretty clear to them that they won't. That's why. This is a slide of different policies passed by different governments of Ukraine between 2014 and 2022. These are policies that are designed to isolate, shrink, and reduce the political power of one portion of Ukrainian society and lock in and magnify the political power of a different portion of Ukrainian society. Most of these policies up here were more popular in Western Ukraine and more controversial in Eastern Ukraine. And um, that's brass knuckle stuff. There were carrots that could have induced the lost territories to rejoin. You know, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can write laws that begin to talk about autonomy. You could have altered the Constitution in ways that begin to talk about autonomy. But the thing is, every time those were discussed, um, they, they were silenced pretty quickly. And I can get into more detail about this, but um, the bottom line is that it became a dominant strategy for a lot of Ukrainians to begin to use the word capitulation or fifth columnist or traitor to the nation to describe anything that uh, catered to the preferences of a lot of Ukrainians, millions of them. Tens of millions started outvoting millions. It stopped being a seesaw that went back and forth, and it became something different. So um, that is not genocide, my friends. <laughs> that is, I, I just, I, I, I hesitate to flag this point again. That's not genocide. That's brass knuckle distributional politics as a result of choices that Putin made to change the electoral map. But that adaptation takes place, and that adaptation freezes. And um, there are real consequences to um, a language law that says that you cannot teach Russian in high schools. That's, that's going to change what Ukraine looks like 25 years from now. And everybody knows it. And that's why they did it. And that is the unnamed war. And that is what uh, Putin says, if you want to take the man seriously and read his essay on historical history and read his own justifications for the invasion, which may just be propaganda. But that is what he says he could not live with. And that is why he felt he had to invade to win Ukraine back. So again, our book ends fairly abruptly with a description of this. Um, it is important to say that uh, he vastly miscalculated his leverage. His ability to use military power in order to get the outcomes in Ukraine that he wanted was wrong. But he was not the only person who made that mistake. I think that a lot of the diplomats in, like, very well-meaning people trying hard to keep the toothpaste in the tube and stop the largest land war in Europe since World War II had the same assumptions, which is that if this war breaks out, Ukraine's just going to lose, and it's going to be really, really tragic when they do. And it turns out that, you know, they were wrong about that. We were wrong about that. Ukraine had become a much more potent fighting force than anybody anticipated. And the whole premise of the OSCE-led Minsk process was that Ukraine couldn't realistically fight the Russian army. You know, NATO would not really back Ukraine. And so autonomy for the Donbass regions is like probably the best you can get. So you ought to just kind of take the deal. That was, that was the Minsk Accords for a long time. And Ukrainians said no, 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 no. And now they feel very validated for having said no. <laughs>
most of them. So um, the mince game is now completely over. It's over. Line through it. So uh, to end this talk, I, I want to say something a little bit provocative that I hinted at at the beginning, which is that I actually am not a pessimist in terms of Ukraine's ability to sustain this war and perhaps even someday win some version of victory. And I know that that sounds strange, but that is what I actually in my heart believe. I have a lot of uncertainty about how this is going to end. And uh, I am unwilling to deal Ukraine out of something that two years ago I would have thought sounded crazy, which is reclaiming all of its 1991 borders. I would have thought that if you had told me three years ago that I would be standing on stage and saying that they might reclaim their 1991 borders, I would have told you um, to look at the military balance. <laughs> and um, now I'm not sure. So I think it's worth asking if they do reclaim all of their 1991 borders, uh, what's going to happen? And uh, how many of the people living within those 1991 borders will actually greet them as liberators when they get there? There's a way to tell this story, which is that it will be just like Kharkiv. And the Ukrainian military will show up and people will come out of their basements and be so grateful that they have been liberated. And that is what happened in the fall of 2022. And I'm just not sure, you guys. I'm just not sure that that's what's going to happen in Crimea. If Crimea is retaken. And um, if we know that some of the reclaimed territory is going to be hard to govern for Ukraine, um, we are going to have to decide, those of us who have backed Ukraine in achieving that military victory, we are going to have to decide what we want to tell them that they ought to do with the pro-Russia population, that they're going to end up governing if they get the territory back. And so that's what it means to have legitimate state capacity in the modern world, in the rules-based international order. And you have to actually be able to hold the loyalty of a population after you capture the land. That's why Article One of the UN Charter is self-determination. So the policies of holding and governing a population will be supported by the West directly in some ways, indirectly in other ways, if they get the territory back. And um, we can come back and talk about the details of this slide. It might be too fuzzy for some of you to read. But um, there's a lot of historical precedent about how this problem has been handled in the past. And I don't feel equally normatively comfortable with each of the rows, speaking only for myself. Some of these rows make me a little bit queasy. And that's a conversation that if Ukraine reclaims its 1991 borders, it will have to begin. And that's why we say that the irony is that if Ukraine gets the territory back, it will likely restart the Minsk game. It will likely restart bargaining over what ought to happen to the governed populations. Now, if they don't, and there is instead an armistice, Korea style, you don't have to restart the Minsk game. You have different problems, but you don't have Minsk game style problems. So I'm going to leave it with that, other than to say that in terms of my own personal politics and my own positionality, um, I can't change anything I just talked about. I don't have any authority over anything. I am an associate professor of politics at the University of California, San Diego. And I consider myself a friend of Ukraine. And I have a Ukrainian flag that I've been flying outside my door since the war started. And I took this picture down. I had it hanging in my house for a long time. And I realized um, that I don't want to look at it anymore. Even though I don't quite know what it means, I took it down. So thank you. We have enough here to keep us going for a semester long seminar and just get started. But we have, in fact, about 15 minutes for questions. Um, we are being recorded. So please uh, give your name and then keep your question focused, if you will, and wait for the microphone. John Friedman, the College of Law. Um, what is it? Thank you. I'm still John Quigley, <laughs> College of Law. Um, and I had an opportunity to observe a lot of what you were talking about in the early period. And I 
and I concur, I mean, in terms of what I saw there with, with the way you're describing it in regard to Crimea. Um, the uh, Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, which it was called prior to 1995, um, saw that there was a problem in Ukraine with the Russian population. Uh, it was part of what they saw uh, throughout the, the uh, territories that had broken off from the Soviet Union, that there was concern about the treatment of the Russians and that that would lead to, to conflict. Um, what the uh, conference did in 1994 was to decide to send a group of what they called experts uh, to negotiate between Crimea uh, and Kiev. Um, I was one of the three people that was an expert. Whether I'm an expert on anything, I don't know. But uh, you know that's the term that, that is used. Um, uh, there was a German fellow and an Italian fellow and, and I. Um, and we spent, uh, I guess, about a year going back and forth uh, trying to assess the positions uh, of the parties um, in regard to Crimea. The focus was on Crimea, so we didn't deal with Donbass, um, uh, even though I think the, the CSC saw that as, as potentially a problem. But Crimea was even more stark, you might say, because, for the reason you stated, that, that the population was uh, very predominantly uh, Russian, many uh, retired military. Uh, we found that they were concerned about things like whether their pensions would get paid because they, they had Russian pensions. They were concerned whether their children could go to the university uh, in Russia if they were no longer uh, part of, of Russia. Uh, so there were some very practical reasons that, that came into play um, uh, along with, I guess, broader geopolitical reasons. Um, but what, what we tried to do was to, I think, square a circle that couldn't be done. Because as you were saying, the, the Russians in Crimea did not want to be part of, of Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine was not interested in giving very much. They weren't interested in having Russian as a second national language, which was a big issue. Um, so what, what I proposed, which probably wouldn't have worked, was a, uh, a situation that would have been autonomy for Crimea, uh, where they would have had substantial control over domestic uh, issues. Uh, and where if Ukraine were to violate their uh, prerogatives, there would be international oversight uh, that would be operated by the, uh, the CSCE. Um, uh, I proposed this to the uh, High Commissioner on National Minorities, Mr. Vanderstol. You've probably come across his, uh, his name in that time period. Um, uh, and I wrote this up in the form of an agreement that would have been an agreement between Crimea uh, and, and, uh, and Kiev. Um, and, and he said, no, it won't work. He wouldn't let me show it to, to the Ukrainian government. He said, if they see this, they'll, they'll uh, turn their backs on the, on the CSCE. Um, I was surprised at his reaction because he had been promoting uh, autonomy for Crimea, but I think he was aware that most of the countries involved, the Western countries, were, were going to be pretty firm backing Ukraine in terms of, of, of its territorial uh, integrity. Um, but I think, as you were saying, uh, Yeltsin was not going to step in and do anything for Crimea. So the Crimeas would, would say to me, as you were saying, uh, Article 1 of the UN Charter, we want self-determination, um, to which I would say, well, uh, what do you want to do with self-determination? Do you want to be a separate country? No. Uh, do you want to be part of Russia? Well, yes, but that's not going to happen. Uh, so we were between a rock and a hard place. Um, and, and Ukraine never gave anything. It always seemed to me that had Ukraine given more 
uh, it would have made it more difficult for Mr. Putin to make the arguments that he made uh, in, in 2022. Well, in terms of in terms of the spirit of the last part of your question, um, the best account of life in Ukraine, a little more up to date than your negotiating experience, is by an ethnographer named Ellie Knott, who had the extraordinary good fortune to have been conducting field work in Crimea shortly before the annexation. And so she's written a book, and I w was a discussant on it at ISA, and it's in English, and you can download it, buy it, scintillating read. Unfortunately, I think it's just completely overtaken by events. but. At the time, what she describes is a whole bunch of people who had kind of adapted to the autonomy that you thought was a good idea. Because they really did have um, the ability to go about their lives in a way where they just didn't think about politics very much. And they had, a good way to think about it is they got to be as Russian as they wanted without having uh, any of the hassle of actually paying um, taxes that would go directly to the FSB, that they um, would be able to be culturally Russian in their hearts while living in a place where they actually had the least possible amount of government. And that's a lot of what a lot of them seem to have wanted according to Ellie's observations. But thank you for sharing yours. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I should yeah, will, you, uh, will you talk a little bit about the, uh, what's been going on since the invasion uh, in the uh, land bridge provinces in terms of the Russian-Ukrainian thing? Are people leaving? Are people accepting it? Are they acquiescing in the Russians? What's, what generally has been going on? We get very little news from there. Yeah, we do get very little news from there, and I want to be careful to not generalize based on s speculation. Um, I think a lot of people are, are hiding and trying to stay away. There have been a lot of populations displaced. It deserves to be said. I wish I had the numbers for um, the contested regions at my fingertips. I don't, but I'm sure you can find them online. The main thing you want to do, of course, is just get out of the way of, um, of an ongoing war. And because the Ukrainian offensive this year is one of the most telegraphed invasions in military history, probably. Everyone sort of knew where they were supposed to be trying to get away from. Um, so leaving aside the fact that you know you obviously have to leave if there's um, landmines in your farm, there are a lot of people who kind of knew that the plan was to try to isolate Crimea um, in order to split the Russian military into two halves. And this is all the sort of thing that if you care more about, uh, you really just have to dive into the operational details that you can find in places like War on the Rocks. But if you don't care about the military side of it and you care about the populations, um, I think it's important to note that prior to, um, prior to February 24th, 2022, this is not a part of the country that was pro-Putin in any way. If you look at the voting turnout, if you look at things that are um, kind of off the shelf data, Dominique has the slides for this prepared better than I do, but um, he uh, and I would both say that this is not a credible, plausible self-determination claim. It's a joke. Um, now, what people have been doing when they do have guns to their heads is um, it's hard to make inferences from that. And this is the, the core of the Ukrainian argument for not wanting to implement Minsk at the time, is that you can't like go and do a survey of an occupied population and say, hey, how do you feel about your occupier? I mean, it's offensive, actually. So you got to be really careful about this kind of stuff. And I think you learn more from people who run away um, than people who stay. But there's limits to what you can learn from people who run away as well, because they're not random. It's not a random selection. So I hope that that answered your question in the spirit you asked it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Is this on? Sorry. It was on? Hi, I'm Angela Brentlinger from the Slavic Department here. I have a quick question about um, the Crimean Tatars. What do you know? They were so active in like pre-2014, re returning, reclaiming, yeah. doing a lot of, act a lot of uh, youth camps, rebuilding. What happened to them? So a lot of them became uh, politically active as insurgents. I've refereed a couple papers um, tracking them. They were, I th although it's hard to get a denominator, I believe that there's pretty credible evidence that they've been overrepresented in um, anti-Putin militias that have gone voluntarily to fight. Uh, and that's, of course, a subset of them, right? That's not everybody. But uh, I only know from a couple of accounts which are, which are biased. But I think a lot of them have, um, uh, well, let, let, me, let me walk that back. I don't know. Some of them, 
uh, have a kind of a 50-year plan <laughs> to, to wait out Putinism. Uh, and, and they realized that they had the, th this is not a matter of waiting for Putin to die. This is a matter for waiting for other things that will have to happen in the glacial long term. But they recognized that they really had um, their demands fairly well recognized by the Ukrainian state um, prior to um, uh, the annexation, and that they'll never get a deal like that again. So they're keeping those documents and they're holding out. But that's the kind of thing that's easier to do in a coffee shop in Chicago than it is in Crimea, right? And so there's just a lot of variation in that population. And the people who talk to me are not necessarily representative of a community. And this is common for indigenous groups around, you know, around the globe, is that the people that you end up talking with are, are not a random sample for reasons beyond reasons. So I, it's hard, though. Um, I, I really want to also just say I can't, um, you can't conflate the Crimean uh, like mobilization, which as I already flagged, I find very heroic and impressive. I think those people are very brave with being a pro-Maidan type mobilization um, on the streets in 2014 at the time. So in other parts of Ukraine, you would see a lot of, you know, uh, blue and yellow flags flying. Um, and you didn't see that in Crimea. Like, you saw something else. You saw the symbolism that I think you're more aware of, and most people aren't. It was a Tatar, like, movement at the time, not a pro-Maidan movement, if you want to draw that distinction. Hi, I'm Alex Thompson in the Political Science Department. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm wondering what you, I think this is, lies just outside of your model, but why do you think Putin chose to invade Ukraine in 2022? Like, what were his actual goals, and why did he feel that he couldn't get a bargain short of war? Yeah, sure. Like threatening war it doesn't, I've never quite understood. I mean, I, I have, I'll give you a couple of, of, of fairly flip answers, uh, but this is something I've given a lot of thought to. As someone who also thought that he was, um, he was bluffing, not bargaining. It's like, I'm going to perform what an invasion would look like in order to get the West to put a lot of pressure on Ukraine to implement Minsk, which is what I really want. Okay. That was my theory of the case for a long time. And I've come to understand that I think that that theory of the case is just wrong. I think he probably decided um, well more than a year before February 24th that he was going to actually see who runs out of ammo first. I believe that he had a theory of victory that was based on motivated misperception from watching the Crimea game tape over and over and over again. I think he thought, really, really thought, that if he could just get to Kiev in the Thunder Run and uh, do some hybrid warfare magic uh, that, you know, raise a flag over the presidential compound, you know, release a bunch of deep fakes, kill Zeluzhny. I believe that he believed that the Russian military had a lot of capability that the Russian military doesn't have, A, and that B, the West was a paper tiger and was going to fumble the ball, and C, that Ukraine was a kind of a fake state and that you really could just keep the birthday cake intact and change the groom and the, the bride at the top and that Ukrainians would be okay with that. And that's a very strange set of beliefs, but I believe that he believed it. And so if you think you can get all of that, you're not deterrable, right? Like none of the West threats of like, we're going to porcupine Ukraine and make this a long war. They're like, no, you won't. The war's gonna be over in two weeks. And you, you know, <laughs> we're, my, I, I, the details of exactly what the settlement would have looked like, you know, we'll, we'll never know. But I think that was his theory. And I think that it was based on, um, you know, those kinds of second image variables that are specific to the relationship of Russia and Ukraine. It's less this Russia's shrinking sphere of influence stuff. Um, although I think that that's probably there too. I mean, I think there is something to the idea, kind of third image, that he calculated that the best deal he gets five years from now is, 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 is substantially worse than starting a war now, and that he could just sort of see that slide happening. One last quick question. Who knows? Domestic politics in this country might have been a variable, too. Hi, Jerry Pankhurst, uh, retired from Wittenberg University. Uh, I'm a sociologist of religion, basically, and you mentioned the autocephaly controversy as one of those stages along the way leading up to the critical years uh, that we've seen the last couple of years. Yes, sir. Um, and I, uh, the interesting thing about that is it's not exactly a zero-sum game as I see it. The um, affiliated church, the church that was affiliated with the Moscow Patriarchate is still probably the most popular church in terms of attendance and all that sort of stuff. And the um, 
Um, the uh, autocephalous church, new church is uh, getting new members all the time, but it's not really winning the day, day broadly, and there's some great doubt about that. So how does that fit into the national symbolic struggle? It's not exactly zero-sum, I don't think. You might be right about that, and you seem to know a lot more about it than I do, um, and I, I want to I take care uh, with, with my language. I do know that Putin himself personally saw it as a threat and um, convened a meeting of his Security Council to talk about it. So that's evidence, to your point. We have thin evidence on what's going on in his actual mind and not just the public statements of the Russian apparatus. But that on that point, it seemed to be zero sum to him. And then, you know, I, I think that the other part of it, although I'm not a specialist in this, is that uh, Taking the talk all the way back to Benedict Anderson, you know, nationalism is based sitting on the back of religious belief, right, and a set of human history that goes back as far as you want it to go. Now that that bell has been rung by uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, as I understand it, um, that bell will never be unrung. There is now an autocephalous church. So while you're kind of doing a head count from 2022, I mean, I, I think that the fact that you ring a bell and everyone says, yeah, well, let's see what the scorecard looks like in, in 2025 is, um, or 2050, or 2300, that's, that's really the deep game. And so I think that's, you know, you start playing around with time, decades or hundreds of years at a time, and um, you, that gets you into a more zero-sum space, with respect. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we will be back again soon with Rob Kelly on North Korea, with Rush Doshi on China, with Mark Lynch on Gaza, and with Adam Lerner on the all too overarching topic of trauma and international order. But in the meantime, I have to say I've never gotten choked up over game theory before. Please uh, give our extraordinary speaker, Jesse Driscoll, your thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>